both of the organizations that you lead are making a really positive impact in society. So can you talk a little bit about your organization and what inspired each of you to start it? I'll start with you, Troy. I get the hard question first. <laughs> I'm going um, to Heather next, don't worry. So Junkature started in 2010, 13 years ago. Um, the, the actual catalyst moment, I, I don't know why it, it did, because um, it, took, it took nine years for me to understand why it started. And the moment that I understood what I, why it started, um, just to give some feedback, so it started in 2010 as a hobby for me. It kind of grew organically over nine years. Um, it was, and I'll explain in a minute just exactly what it was, but, but the moment, and my, my family used to say to me, why are you doing this? I have other companies. I was busy all the time. They were profitable, and the question was asked to me all the time, why are you doing this other thing? It seems to eat so much of your time. If you put the work in over here, look, look at the profit would grow and so on. Um, and what happened in 2019 was uh, I went to college for the first time. I didn't go to college when I was 17. I went off to MIT to do a master's. Uh, in leadership, because I believed that Junkature had a place in the world, and I didn't have the expertise to bring it there, so I needed to invest in me first. And the first night I was there, um, the facilitator brought out a box of Kleenex, and he said, we're going to need this tonight because everybody's going to cry. Now, you have 68 global entrepreneurs in the room, and I remember the guy beside me is from Vancouver, and he goes, this is a business course, what are we going to cry for? <laughs> right? Um, and I was in the same boat, right? And you see, macho-ness takes over. So he was going, I'm not crying. I'm not, not going to cry. What is this all about? But um, we didn't know what was in front of us. And so that night, he, the guy divided us into little groups. And then he came around one by one to each group. And when he came around to me, he said, so um, you know, on your application form, you have four companies. But this junkature one stands out. Can you tell me why? And I said, you know, I love working with young people. I love fashion. I love creativity. But why? I love the energy of it, and I love working with young people, and I love it, but why? And he just kept saying, but why, right? And after eight or nine times, you've no idea how much you want to punch that guy in the face, right? <laughs> um, and I'm sitting there, and the, the tears just start running down my face, right? Because he was getting the PR answers, and that wasn't what he was looking for. And, and I'd never been through a process like that before, so I just started to cry. And the words that came out of my mouth in that moment, I didn't see them coming, and I just said, because every one of those kids was me. And in that moment, I realized, too, who I was and who I hid. And so as a teenager, and this is what Junkature is built out of, so Junkature is the largest sustainable fashion competition in the world. And it's built out of two things of me as a kid, but I never realized that. So as a kid growing up in rural Ireland, the word sustainability didn't exist, because we live sustainably. Everything that came into our homes was reused in some way, we saw nature as a real gift. We spent a lot of time in the fields around the river where we come from. It's, it's hard to believe now. Like my sister still lives there. She's afraid that her kids would go to the river. Like it's, it's crazy, right, that we used to be there every day, unsupervised, and all my mom would care is, you're back before sundown, right? Um, who changed that narrative in 40 years? But, um, but that was the life we grew up with. And then the other side of me as a kid was, I was terrible at sports. And the way I saw it at school at that time was sports brought so much social capital. And I never thought about why, um, but this was part of that realization. I was a creative person, so I was much more in tune to be creating things or making art. Sports was not my thing, but yet and all, the cool kids were the sports kids. And there was no way for the kids that weren't in sports to get that cool. So what Junkature became, as I call it now, is the sport for creative kids. So these creative kids take to the stage. We're going to see some of them later on. Um, they use recycled materials to create high-end fashion. And that's what it is on the surface. And that, that's fantastic. But underneath all that, they get seen for who they are. They get celebrated for being a creative. They get. I'll let Heather do a bit now. But, that, but that's basically the, the, the premise of the whole thing. And it's become now a global thing. 100,000 kids have taken part. And we'll go through some of that as we go on. And Heather, before you go, I, I just need to point out for everyone that the shoe game on stage is, 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 is we got it going on, don't we? <laughs> OK, 
story. Thank you, thank you. Well, my story of One Green Thing and why I created it, I wrote the book, it really it starts up with a dinner table conversation. In 2019, my older daughter, who was a freshman in high school at Bozeman High in Bozeman, Montana, in the states where I'm from, asked permission to walk out of school to attend the Greta Thunberg-inspired climate strike. And I'm an environmentalist, so I said, well, of course you can go. But then my mom energy kicked in, and I checked the weather report, and it was supposed to be a thunderstorm. And she had a heavy backpack, and she carried a trumpet, and the rally was about a mile and a half from the school, and I said without even thinking, you know what, sweetie, I'll just pick you up from school, and I'll drive you to the climate rally. <laughs> um, and um, she said, wait, what? <laughs> You're gonna pick me up from a walkout, not cool. Uh, you're going to drive me in our gas car to a climate rally. Mom, you're worried about my backpack and my trumpet. What about my future? And she said, I am so sick and tired of all this praise for Gen Z young activists. Greta this, Greta that. Where are the baby boomers? Where is Gen X? You cannot leave this crisis all on our shoulders. We feel all alone, and she started crying. And my younger daughter was right there and said, yeah, what she said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, what was so challenging, Jen, as you know, this is my life's work. I majored in environmental science. I worked for Al Gore's campaign in, in 2000, the one that didn't work out the way that I was hoping. You know, I, um, I had worked on Capitol Hill for a senator doing energy and environment policy work. I had run three national environmental nonprofits. And I thought if my kids felt alone in climate action, what was happening around other dinner tables. So I realized two things. Well, first of all, I put on my rain jacket and went to that climate rally, just so you know. Not in the car, though, right? Not in the car. I walked. <laughs> I walked. I want to be really clear. I walked to that rally. <laughs> but as I was walking with my family that day, I realized I needed to start to research the mental health impacts of the climate crisis called eco-anxiety, climate anxiety, solastalgia, climate grief, climate doom, eco-grief, lots of words for this feeling and that I needed to create a way for more people to see themselves in climate action. And that's really where the journey of One Green Thing came from. And I, I just want to make sure that everyone here understands that without clean air, clean water, and a livable climate, there is no well-being. Well-being and purpose are intrinsically linked to sustainability and climate action. And that's why I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. Yeah. Th thank you both. And, and I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go a little off script here because in listening to you both, um, even though I've heard you speak several times before, what comes up for me in the work that both of you are doing besides purpose and having that as a key element of human sustainability is legacy. Yes. Um, and Heather, you and I have talked about this many times before, especially when it comes to potentially challenging topics like climate change and having conversations intergenerationally. I think that's probably true with Junk Couture as well. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. I'm so glad you asked that, Jen, because one of the things that Mike said yesterday is that purpose is an anchor into the future. But we need to start talking about what does that future look like. And when it comes to Gen Z, there was a global survey published in September 2021 in Lancet of 10,000 young people ages 16 through 25. 47% said that climate anxiety interfered with their daily life. One in four do not want to have children of their own because of the climate crisis. I want to be really clear, not a lifestyle choice, but because of the climate crisis, one in four do not want to have children of their own because they're not really sure what this future entails. And so this idea for all of us, um, this is a call to action. This is the biggest challenge of our time, and we don't have that much time to reduce warming to 1.5 degrees, and when there's even reports that say we've already hit that mark. So we're running out of time, but we need to start leaning into the idea of seeing ourselves as ancestors. And I write about the importance of long-term thinking, of embracing that, but also it starts very personally and deeply by asking the young person, 
the young people in your life, a young person that you love, ask them how they feel about the future we're leaving them. And to every person I know, because a lot of times, I know, Jen, you've heard this, but I get this, this um, well, Heather, your kids have eco-anxiety because they're your kids, right? I mean, this is what you do. And to a person, when I said ask a young person who, that you love how they feel about the future, it has been a game-changing conversation. And then people realize that we all have a unique role to play in climate action. We all need to get involved, and it does start with those intergenerational conversations. You have anything to add there, Troy? I think for me, the legacy side of it is, um, I think the best way is like I tell a story of one of the kids that um, has been through Junkature because I, I think the thing for me is, uh, the goal of Junkature is very simple, is help young people find the diamond inside themselves and, and let it shine. And at the same time, around that, wake up this creative energy that's in every classroom in the world that is dormant, in my opinion, and um, give it a purpose around climate. So what can they do? How can they get their voice out there? Um, and I think, you know, so this young guy that I knew from Ireland, a young LGBT guy, um, very creative, very quiet, introvert. Um, he entered Junkature a few times. Um, I think we have a photo of that guy, have we? But he made this suit from VHS cassette, okay? So the story of this suit is, is it's a year-long process. And um, so at the start, he, he, it's all a homage to the cinema because his grandparents were involved in the cinema. Um, he learned to crochet, uh, so skills that were, were lost. But then the big thing then through all of the process of the year was he learned so much about himself, resiliency and so on, um, but he won the overall prize. And as part of the overall prize, and because it was a, a homage to the cinema, he got to go to Cannes Film Festival. Um, he was at Royal Film Premiers, I mean, Prince Charles and so on. Um, and he was interviewed a, couple, you know, a, year, a year later on radio, or he was, I was asked by this radio presenter, God, these are huge things. Even for like an adult, they're huge things. Like most adults will never be in Cannes Film Festival. But as a young 17-year-old, these are huge. What was the biggest thing of all these things? And so this young guy, 17, he paused for just a second. And he said, actually, none of those. The biggest thing for me was I found my personality. And it wasn't that for me. What I realized in that moment was he didn't, because it was always there. It was that other people saw it. And that was the power of being seen for who you are. Right? That was the thing. And so a lot of these young people are there. They have skills that we don't value. Um, a couple of examples. I, I, there's an interview that I use that Lady Gaga did. Um, we've been fortunate to work with her foundation around some things. But she talked about her time in school. And this is a 40-year-old woman saying, and in that interview, she says, I've been bullied all my life. You're worth how much? Hundreds of millions. How can your mindset say I've been bullied all my life? She says, I was a creative kid in school. What does that look like? My teachers are saying you need to do science, you need to do maths. That's what they say. What do I hear? I hear my skills are shit. So I tanked at school. Then I didn't want to be there anymore. And that, for me, was the way I, my experience at school. So that was the way all these kids were experiencing the same thing. So my first thing to legacy was to lift those young people out of that by giving them an experience where their skills were celebrated. And we came to this conclusion that the mantra of Junkature was no one ever changed the world by being the same as anyone else. Let's celebrate the difference. <laughs> Let's, they have the purpose, right? As Heather said, right? They really want to make a change. Um, um, I know Jen, you're from Deloitte, but we had, Deloitte invited us to speak at a new partner conference. We brought a 16-year-old girl from Pakistan. And the guy went off script, the interviewer, right? That threw me completely, right? <laughs> and then he asked her a question, and I was like, God, that's not the question he was supposed to ask her, <laughs> right? So he asked her, and he said to the audience, this is the voice of the future, right? This is 16-year-old girl Maha from Pakistan. Maha, what advice do you have to the room, right? And then she turned around and went, this is the mistake that adults make. We're not the voice of the future. We're the voice of the present. Why are you not listening? And that, to me, even in that moment, was such a wake-up call, right? And I was like, I couldn't have said it any better. She was not phased at all. We need more of that in the room.
So how do we get more of that from both of you? You both, your organizations work with other large organizations. How do you get them on board? How do you lead and engage with them to understand the need, the importance, and even the urgency? Oh, it's such a good question, Jen. I think the first thing we need to do is really listen, mm -hmm. is listen um, and create that space and let young people know that they're not alone. I'm just kind of piggybacking off of what Troy just said, this idea that we're the voices of the future. One of my dear friends is Aaron Brockovich. If you don't know the film, you should definitely check it out. But, but Aaron wrote the foreword to my first book and one of the things she said is Superman's not coming. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the people we've been waiting for. No one's gonna swoop in and solve these huge challenges ahead. And that of course relates to this whole concept of purpose. So, so listening, one of the things I've done in addition to researching eco-anxiety and just giving the name to it, a lot of people have it, they don't know it, it's not in the DSM. This is a new phenomenon, <clears throat> but the American Psychological Association identified it in 1997. But more and more people are experiencing this, this deep concern about the future. Young people, Gen Z knows that this is an intersectional issue. It's the number one issue they have. It connects to racial equality, it connects to economic equality, it, it, it um, connects to global equality. They see all the intersectional issues. They also know that people who've contributed the least amount of carbon pollution are suffering the most. This is true racially, this is true internationally. It's also true intergenerationally. I graduated high school in 1990. The majority of carbon dioxide pollution in the atmosphere today was created after 1990. And that means that my grandchildren, if I ever have them, will experience more climate losses than I will in my life based on pollution that was created in my lifetime. So I think that's really important. But one of the things we do at One Green Thing, and in addition to having this conversation about the mental health impacts of the climate crisis and what could the future look like if we get it right, because that's sometimes a missing, like we all get the apocalypse, right? That's not that far away, especially if you're living in the States right now. It, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to imagine the apocalypse, but what could that that future look like if it is um, actually sustainable and green. But one of the things that we do, because again, this is the biggest challenge of our lifetime and we all have a unique role to play, is that I created an assessment, it's a little bit like Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or Strength Finders, and the question is, who are you in service? How do you show up for the people that you love? And you take this short assessment and then I match you to a daily practice of sustainability. It's a 21-day plan, kind of like a fitness plan and you do one thing every day, one green thing, and the idea is not because you're gonna solve the climate crisis. I mean, Jen, I, I know you and Troy will laugh about this. Whenever I skip the straw, my kids give a slow clap. <laughs> well done, mom, you've solved the climate crisis. You skipped that straw. Um, but the fact is, yeah, thank you very much, I did it. Uh, but the, the fact is, is though, is having, that, that one simple act of skipping the straw says to the barista, wherever I am, this is not a value that I have. And we all are cultural change agents. Our individual action changes the culture. And that's what we need for these big policy solutions to work. And actually, plastic is a great example. When my, my kid is 16 years old, living in Bozeman, Montana, you know, you, what are you supposed to do when it comes to global plastic pollution, right? But the fact is, is individuals saying, no, I'm worried about this. No, I don't want that. To the, my favorite takeout restaurant, you need to have compostable packaging. The United Nations is now talking about a global treaty to eliminate single-use plastic. And that only happens when individuals take action. So this idea of there's seven different archetypes, we all have a unique role to play in service, we all do one thing, this daily practice of sustainability, think about it like meditation or prayer or yoga. It's part of your wellness practice, but you're doing this intentionally to try to shift the culture for these big solutions. So, so Troy, where did the idea of using junk to create these incredible fashions that we're going to see later that we see on the screen come from? That's simple. <laughs> it's because as a kid, we had no money. And so <laughs> as a kid, as a creative kid, all we had was <clears throat> trash. To, it wasn't trash to us. Yeah. So, um, and I mean, the cornflake box was a world of wonder. So I think we had St. Patrick's Day last weekend and I was just talking to somebody about it. I said, God, as kids, we used to make our St. Patrick's Day badges from the cornflake box. Um, and it was the same, I remember watching the Karate Kid as a kid <laughs> and, and, and knitting a karate suit 
out of old dusters that my mother had and a bit of a jumper and so on. Um, but that was just fun, right? And this, we didn't know any better. Right. So um, at the outset was, uh, I think the story went for me, well, Ireland had left all that behind. We became a much more affluent economy and with money came other things. We became disposable economy. And the story uh, in 2008 with this Celtic tiger, Irish economy was roaring. And there's an anecdote, and it's just an anecdote, I don't know if it's true or not, but the story goes that this lady went into a garage and got a new car, and as she drove away, she's one or two miles down the road, and she got a flat tire. So she rang the garage and said, can you bring me a new car? Because it had got so much into the world of, well, my time is precious. I just pay to solve these kind of problems without any kind of idea of responsibility, right? And so, and you still see that today. There are, especially when you look at the number of, you know, private jet flying all over. It's, it's personal responsibility and people just go, oh, well, my little bit doesn't matter. But that's exactly what you're, they're saying about this. One straw does matter. One straw, one person does matter because all of a sudden, if a million people do that, you have a million straws, but you have to set the culture. Somebody has to start the ripple effect, throw the, the thing in the pond. Um, but so for me as a kid, what, that, so that was the way it was. And then in, in 15 years ago, so it was two years before Junkature started, I did a lot of travel around South America. And I remember being in this lady's home. Um, we didn't speak the, the, the same language, but she was getting somebody to translate because she really wanted me to know that she had made the table mats. And the table mats were made by 30 corks from wine bottles glued together in a circle, and when they hardened, si sliced. And that just brought me back to the, my life as a kid in Ireland. And I said, okay, what would happen if we just brought that back? Now, to be totally honest, like 13 years ago, this was about creativity for me. Yeah. The sustainability thing wasn't even on my agenda, right? That was, it was really about, I want to create a platform where the creativity that I had a kid as a kid would, would be valued because it wasn't, I, I did accountancy, right? Because they told my mom, there's no money in art. You need to do something else. So I did accountancy because that was somebody else's idea for me. Um, but the, the art's always there. I always go back to that stuff. Um, I, I still write stories and I've written play. I'm, 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 I'm always mulling around with things. Uh, and that was my real objective at the start. The other things that happened through it, I have to say they're by fluke. You know, I didn't set out at the start to go, this would free people. I didn't know what it would do. Um, but somebody said to me recently, like, I mean, it is because those kids are, I understand them, right? And I understand why it has to be this way. The other thing as well is I wasn't an alpha male. So I, you know, I like buying handbags for my wife, right? That's a thing, right? Um, I love shoe shopping. Husbands pay attention. <laughs> Before Le Bouton did sneakers, my wife had so many pairs. And then so the first thing before I'd go anywhere, I would get a note going, don't bring back any handbags and shoes. <laughs> I have too many, right? Um, but that was just, I like fashion, so that was just the way it was. Um, and that too, in school, didn't fit. It's like, where do you fit in a box? And that was the whole thing for me, is like, why do we have to label people? Now, when I go back to 2019, that was transformational for me, the MIT thing, but also I started then going out into the world and going, I need to understand what sustainability is, really. What is the problem? Um, and then, this is the thing, so many terms are thrown at you. Net zero you know, decarbonization, reuse, re recycle. All, like, I mean, it's just a minefield. And so one of the things that we, we touched on legacy earlier on that I think that we have an organization, 100,000 kids have been through Junkature and uh, the target's a billion, but that's an army, right? And I think one of the things is a legacy that I have, I've distilled this down to three words, and that is that capital rewards consumption. And what I mean by that is this, we are consuming the planet to make money that is what we're doing. And that is a circle that will not stop. So it doesn't matter, right? We have created the formula. Unless that formula changes, no matter what any of this stuff happens, we will not fix it. And as an entrepreneur, one of the things that we're taught as, and in our companies it's the same, if you fix the symptoms, you will not fix the problem. You have to go to the problem and solve it. And so one of the things I think as we grow our community, is that we need to teach them in a subtle way, because it's Junkature is all about cool, you'll see it later on, but in a subtle way, we need to plant in there that, that people and planet also have a value, because at the minute they don't. GDP is not measured by any of those things. And until that changes, for me, the problem will, 
we'll do all these great things and we'll get closer, but we won't, we won't get there. So for both of you, your work is incredibly purpose and mission driven, the theme of the World Happiness Summit. And sometimes, maybe most or all of the time, when you're doing very purpose-driven work, there seems to be a lot of barriers. <laughs> so can you talk about <sighs> some of the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you talk about some of the barriers, but talk about how you overcome them? Because I think that's where we get stuck. Yes, so um, first I want to talk about a quote that actually, Jen, you wrote about. This is how I know it. It's, it's an Ariana Huffington quote. Burned out people will continue to burn up the planet. Burned out people <laughs> will continue to burn up the planet. Can you do it again? Yeah, mm, no, please, yeah. <laughs> and and um, burnout, it does affect the bottom line. We've all experienced it, we've all done that. So I think uh, for all of you that are in this purpose-driven work, this mission-oriented work, this importance of rest, of recovery, of um, refilling the well, of connecting at places like this is so, so important. So I think that that's burnout is a real barrier to doing this type of work, especially these young people who are so driven by it. I think the second thing with sustainability is that this is a term I learned from my Gen Z teenagers. There's a lot of gatekeeping in, in the environmental movement and a lot of people want to get involved but they're afraid. You know, they're like, oh gosh, I, you know, I, I have this new sustainable sneaker brand, which I do. Um, but then they find out, oh no, the bamboo is not sourced for someplace else and I made the decision and then, oh, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this, maybe I'm not qualified, maybe I shouldn't be here. And so that's where we really lean into at One Green Thing, this idea that you don't have to be all things to all people in the environmental movement. For example, my younger daughter is, excuse me, my older daughter is a beacon. That's the personality profile of the person who wants the bullhorn, they want to be at the podium, you know, they'll take their shoe off and pound it on the table and say, we need climate action now. That's not everybody's vibe, for lack of a better word. But my younger daughter, you know, her profile is the spark. And um, this is the plus one. This is the cheerleader. And if we don't have a somebody, the somebody that will go see a documentary with us, go support the local land trust, go call the member of Congress, there's no movement. So everybody has a different way that they can show up. And I think that that is a barrier for a lot of people to get involved. My way to overcome that is through this assessment on service and helping people understand that to be an environmentalist, you just need to care about the future of the planet. There are a lot of people who fit that profile. <laughs> so come on in, the water's warm. I think I'll also say that, unfortunately it's getting a lot warmer too. Um, <laughs> but I think I would also say that um, sustainability, everything will be sustainable. Like e every job is a climate job. We hear that from our friends at Project Drawdown all the time. No matter what you do, whether you're a life coach, whether you do HR, whether you do interior design, fashion design, or you're a teacher, whatever it is, climate is going to affect every aspect of what we do. We have all of the solutions. We know what we need to do. We know what we need to do. There's not a technical issue or technological issue we're waiting for. What is missing is the political will, and that happens with all of us. So to, to sum up, what I would say, Jen, is this idea of rest and recovery, this idea of talking about burnout, understanding that the fear of an uncertain future in a global, global world that's warming is really impacting us, leading into a positive vision of the future. What could it look like if we had green design at the center of everything, if we had rooftop gardens and mass transit uh, powered by clean energy? It could be beautiful. We could create something so incredible that future generations will thank us for, rather than carrying that anger and, and frustration but also the importance of making sure everyone sees themselves in this movement. So those are, that's how I would sum that up. Thank you, thank you. Barriers for me. Uh, all right, Troy, you kind of did this yeah. when I asked about barriers, no, so. Because <laughs> I think, I don't know if it's a mistake or not, but it's, it's who I am as a person. So I started Junkature as, as an entrepreneur, not as, as an impact business, right? And so for me, it wasn't about, because most people say, well, you're doing good, that's an NGO, that's a not profit, right? And so the challenge for me was, could I create a business where the product wasn't consumption, right? It was impact. And so, of course, when you sit in front of all those impact investors and they just go, skip past that bit to the numbers, <laughs> 
you're like, well, that's the biggest barrier that I've encountered because it's a PR for most people at the moment. Like it is really and truly, it's a PR exercise. It's a tick box at the end going, yeah, we're green. We do this, we do that. But I have been in those rooms and that is a challenge. And you know, so as an impact entrepreneur, the idea is that the business becomes sustainable in itself. You're not looking for donations. The business has partners like Deloitte or, or, or Microsoft and these companies, and they have to get an ROI. So you have to deliver something to them for them to come back again, and, and it's a product that you sell. And that's the impact that they see. That is a challenge because in the world, people don't believe that exists. They don't, most capitalists believe, I have to sell a product that's consumption to make profit. And the minute you turn around and go, no, and I remember having a conversation with, um, a venture cap one of the most famous venture capitalists in the world, and within five minutes, he realized that for the kids it was free. Mm -hmm. And so the reason it was free for the kids is because I wanted to, that it was open to everybody in the world. And so I wanted the kids in Mumbai could be a part of our program as kids in New York or London or Paris or whatever it was. You need two things, trash and imagination. You, our, our world final was in Monaco recently. We had 118 kids from 21 countries, including Afghanistan and Pakistan and Morocco and Iran, and they're all there free because their partners fly them in and so on. So I wanted that as a, a buyer. The minute this venture capitalist heard that the kids were free, you, you're leaving money off the table. <laughs> I was like, there's enough money for everybody else through the ticket sales and the spawn. No, 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 you're leaving money off the table. And for 25 minutes, he told me everything that was wrong with my business plan. And then I was like, he actually, it took me days to recover. <laughs> because he told me my baby was ugly. You know, that's basically <laughs> what he did. <laughs> and I'm so passionate about it, right? Um, now, in fairness, there are 60 investors in Junkature, and every one of them is there for the right reasons. They value the impact. They value not just the impact in the environment, but also in the social part of it. And they do want to make a return on their investment. But when they come to read the deck, they do read the impact statements and they read the statements from the kids of been through this and what they've learned. And then the same now, we describe our alumni as either uh, circular engineers or circular entrepreneurs because they go out with a different mindset into the world. So even in London here, we have a guy, SML, who's designing clothes now that it's a sustainable fabrics. And because we have put so much effort in over that year to expose them to the challenges that we got. And we send them off, as I said earlier, we have this army. And the way you want to change the world, you have to build that army. And you have to give it the right tools. So that's kind of the way we are overcoming that. But if anybody knows any investors in the room that want impact. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share his contact info. So, so one last question that I want both of you to answer, um, because you've each touched on it in your own way, and we've heard so many of the speakers touch on it over the, the last day or so, is the mental health crisis, and in particular, the mental health crisis that's impacting our youth. And Heather, you've talked about it as inco anxiety. Um, Troy, I've heard you talk about the intersection of mental health and, and creativity. Um, so I just want to expand on that a little bit and what you're seeing in, in each of your worlds, um, because I think ending this discussion without an acknowledgement of, of what's really going on there and how each of your organizations is helping support our young people and their mental health. I'm gonna try to answer this quickly. I know, and I know. you're gonna interrupt <laughs> if, I, if I keep talking, okay? So in my research, I, I call it the eco-anxiety trifecta. I think it's important to understand why young people are feeling this way. One, Gen Z has such high rates of generalized anxiety. The Surgeon General, we, you heard him talk about that today. Second, chronic loneliness. Um, Dr. Murthy talked about that as well. A recent survey by Cigna said that five out of 10 baby boomers experience chronic loneliness, eight out of 10 Gen Zers. That means that young people are lonelier than the elderly. And if you're a baby boomer and I called you elderly, I'm sorry, but that's what the, <laughs> that's what the research says. Um, and then, and then third is a hyper awareness of the impacts of the climate crisis driven by social media. When we talk about social media, we think a lot of it's brands or maybe there's concerns about bullying, which there is, but we forget in real time these young people are seeing the impacts of wildfires. 
you know, people escaping in a, you know, a town in Italy because of wildfires or flooding in Germany or drought in Kenya. They are seeing young people report in real time the impacts of the climate crisis. Those three factors are really significant. What we do at One Green Thing is that we ask people to lean into a daily practice of sustainability to exercise agency. Having that agency of knowing you're doing your part, even if you're going outside for a few minutes just to reset, or you're calling your member of parliament, or you're researching a climate solution, there's all these different ways that you can show up. And you will not solve the climate crisis as an individual, but you are a cultural change agent in your community, within your family. And by having that conversation and having this daily practice, not only can you ease your anxiety about the future, but you can shift that culture so these big solutions work. Because even you know, in the United States, we just passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Biggest investment we've ever had, historic, $400 billion invested into climate solutions in the United States. That includes tax credits for EV cars, EV infrastructure. It includes solar, wind, you name it, all these tax credits. But if people don't sign up, it does not matter. So it is not either or. Young people are like, we need systemic change. But what happens is that when, when we say we need systemic change, which of course we do, people hear I don't matter. How can I affect systemic change? The way that you affect systemic change is you start right now as an individual doing what you can do and, and embracing that one green thing. For me, Jen, it's easier, easier to explain the story. So um, I remember getting a letter from a mom. It's, it's six years ago now, even more, six, seven years ago. And the letter said, uh, started out saying, my daughter has been self-harming for two years. And we've had her with psychologists and therapists, and they couldn't find the answer. And she entered Junkature as just a fluke thing at school, was happening at school. And the night before, we have a semi-final event. The night before the semi-final event, she came to me and says, Mom, I can't wear this dress tomorrow. Would my sister wear it? And so Mom says, sure, sure, don't worry about it. Don't worry, your sister will do it, your sister will do it. So at our event, the sister wore the dress and the dress made it through to the final. And so then the mom continues, the night before the final, she came to me again and she said, mom, would my sister mind if I wore this dress tomorrow? And the mom was like, of course not, of course not, of course not. And so the mom continues, this is six months later, I have a new kid at home. She's found herself, she's found friends, she's going to college. Thank you so much for what you did, right? And I, And I remember, like, Jane, Jane works for me, and Jane started working with me over COVID, and we're, I was telling her the story, and one of the days she said to me, did you ever track down that girl, whatever happened to her? So we got on Facebook that evening, and we tracked down the girl, right, young girl, and I said, you know, we're just talking about your story, and, you know, wondering how you are, and what you're doing, and would you ever want to come and talk about it? And um, so there was no reply for a couple of hours, and then a couple of hours later, she wrote back, she said, I can't believe you remember me. But she says, today was a massive day for me. I got my first class honors degree in Cambridge because of you. Aww. How cool is that? Right, and so, like, in a way, like, this all comes back to this thing for me, right, is, you know, if we're seen for who we are, how does that change our whole dynamic and well-being in the world? Like, all of us are just searching to be seen for who we are. That, that for me, was the, the big thing. And then I do want to go back to something Heather said earlier, because also, I mean, if you boil it down to very minimalist things, and I think about some of these things sometimes, we're 21 elements. We came from nature. How powerful is it just spending time in nature? That's it. So why do we want to destroy it? Thank you. Thank you both so much, yes. And Troy, can you, can you just give us a little bit about what we're getting ready to experience with the kids of Junk Couture? Okay, so I think we have seven young people. Um, these are f a, just a cross-section of society of seven examples of Junk Couture. So the challenge in Junk Couture is there's, there's a couple of elements. One, they have to come up with a theme. They have to create a dress around that using trash material, something that would normally go to the bin. They have to then perform on stage for 45 seconds with music that they, they choose. Um, and I just, I want to highlight one, there's a number of incredible designs here, but I met these two sisters um, at the World Final in Monaco, because one was 13 and one was 14, right? And these two, I remember I saying to them, what age are you guys? Because most of them are 16 or 17, these two guys just stood out for me. But their dress is special because they explained that 
they created it from ribbons, and on each ribbon is written a wish from young people in their school, their locality. There's 283 wishes. I think the, the biggest one is that cancer didn't exist, mm. right? But it is a powerful message to the world. These two girls are incredible. Look out for that dress. All right, and so you're going to see these. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Troy.